Hello and welcome. We, we are so happy to have you here with us today. Today we are going live with Laura Fiala of Evidence-Based Birth and she will be talking to us about planning our postpartum. So before we get too far along, I wanna show you again what I'm super excited about today because we have t-shirts. Oh, I'm showing you back. We have t-shirts and they're going out this weekend. So if you haven't registered yet, do it super quick so we can get your shirt out in the first batch and so that it'll get there in time for, um, for the conference. So excited about that. And then I'm gonna introduce Laura. So Laura Fiala is an amazing person and also a doula and childbirth educator who fell in love with birth when she had her first baby. She was scared and clueless when she became pregnant and knew the small child growing inside her had to come out at some point, but how? Yeah, I remember that thought too, yes. <laughs> she and her husband took a class and learned all about birth and so much more. They also learned that birth can be amazing, uplifting and inspiring. Laura's firstborn changed her life in, thousand, in a thousand different ways. She would not be sitting where she is today without his birth. Laura firmly believes families deserve to be respected and listened to on their day like she was on her own. Uh, welcome, Laura. We're so excited to have you with us today. Hello. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Am I just jumping in here, Jenny? <laughs> yeah, okay. go ahead. Yeah. All right. Um, well, hi. Um, so um, I am Laura. Um, all the things Jenny said are true. Um, I also have a second, I also have a second kiddo at home too. Um, which um, propelled me into the love of home birth. So if you ever want to talk home birth, um, I'll be there for you. Um, and so all kinds of fun things. Um, I really love talking about postpartum um, with my class clients, with my dual clients, um, because it's really, really, really important. And I did not prepare enough for it with either of my kids. And I kind of fell into it, a decent postpartum with my first. And then I had my second baby and I was like, oh my God. And it took way too long, way too long to come out, out from it. So, um, I think it's so important that we take the time to prep for this. Um, and, I heard this quote, I was listening to a podcast the other day um, and um, it was some home birth midwives talking and they, one of them said, they're like, birth is like running a marathon um, and then finishing and picking right back up and starting another one because now we're into parenthood. It's like, there's no break. You get this like hour glory period. And then it's like, I have to care for another human being. Like, That's so yeah. Sad. Oh my God. And, you know, so it's like, we talk all about this, like you wouldn't go and run a marathon on no sleep, no food, no, like no prep work. Right. And so now we're asking you to run, like, really, it's like a marathon and then like an ultra marathon because, you know, like parenthood lasts like, you know, 18 years, <laughs> right. They start to sleep at some point, <laughs> but, um, it, 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 it takes a while and it's, you know, we come up against um, these problems and like Sarah, um, introduced while well, we were introducing ourselves before we hopped on Facebook live, we were kind of talking about, um, what was shocking to us about postpartum. And even like, we just don't talk about a lot of this stuff. And so, um, I really want to give some insights and like, I, I also really love when people talk back. So if y'all want to interact with me, feel comfortable, like, please do. Um, talk back or not, Laura, you better okay. like tell me to shut up. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I think that postpartum really starts before postpartum. If you're going to have a good journey and you're going to have, um, you've got to be intentional about it. You've got to, um, have some forethought and do a little bit of planning because, you know, TV and movies paint this postpartum period like it's a vacation. And really it's, um, you know, a lot of interrupted sleep and you're leaking from everywhere. And everyone thinks that in our, most people in our society think that we should be super moms and hop right back into life three days after birth. And it's like, we applaud these people that are like back out and doing things. And it's like, um, okay. So, um, another quote that I really like to throw out there to when I talk with people is, um, that, 
um, in the Ayurvedic culture, so um, that's you know Eastern uh, parts of the world, um, that they have a, a theory and a saying that the first 40 days postpartum dictate our next 40 years of feminine health. And so like you think about it in the US, we have all these people that are like 40s, 50s, 60s in these awful perimetopause, bladder prolapse, like can't go on a walk without wearing depends. I mean, walk down, like we should not have half an aisle of adult underwear, like, or what not adult incontinence, adult diapers is where I'm going. <laughs> um, like we shouldn't, it shouldn't be that way, but we don't like, it's what our culture has been for so long. So um, hopefully we can start to prep and change some of that because really postpartum can be this beautiful and glorious things. And there are places around the world that don't have words for postpartum depression. Like they don't have words for postpartum anxiety. They don't like understand what that is because they are so well surrounded and so well taken care of that it's just like, it's a rite of passage and it's really honored. Um, I just gave myself some chills talking about it. Um, <laughs> um, and I, I, I hope that we can get there because our postpartum, my postpartums, we're not that. Like, <laughs> we're not that. And um, um, so, um, so let's get to like a little bit of planning. Um, and um, Sorry, I'm reading the <laughs> reading the comments. Um, yeah, like it's uh, most people aren't. So like, I guess okay. So my first, I like lucked into a decent postpartum with my first baby because I was like just sat on the couch and watched Netflix all day because I didn't have much else to do. <laughs> we had our our chair. My recliner was positioned so that I could open the Arcadia door for the dogs and close it without getting up. <laughs> and my baby slept on me all day long. Like. I didn't care about the dishes. I don't really care about the dishes anyways. You can ask anybody that's come to my house. There's always dirty dishes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, but with my second baby, then I had a toddler and I was up doing things way too fast. So we were at the park at like 10 days postpartum, like pack up, drive, go to a park kind of thing postpartum. Like my second baby screamed in the car all the time. Like I'm leaking from everywhere. He's got an awful latch. Um, yeah, that's a whole other thing we can talk about when providers make you drive 30 plus miles to get told something that you already know for a consult because that's, anyways, that's a whole other story. So um, we have lots of things in our society that need fixing, but how do we help fix those now? So um, I wanna start with the um, initial postpartum um, like the immediate postpartum, like you had your baby and you're like, what is on me? Like, I just pushed this thing out or, you know, this baby was just birthed through my belly or however they came to be on you. You're like, oh, what just happened? Right. So like that looks a lot different for a lot of different people. And your immediate postpartum is really, really tied to your birth. And so like, it's hard. I'm like, I want to talk all about postpartum, but it's like, it's hard to get into postpartum if we're not talking about birth. Um, and so when we're prepping for our birth, a lot of that is like, how does your immediate postpartum look? Like, what is your care provider? What is that norm for your care provider? Like, do you get your baby on your chest right away? Or are they going to go to the warmer and not be seen for five, 10, 15 minutes? And like in those, like, it sounds like short periods of time, but like, it's instinctual for you to want your baby on you. And it feels like eternity when they're across the room. So like, what does that look for like for your provider? What does it look like if something happens? Like we want, I want you to have this beautiful, awesome and amazing birth where this baby comes up on you and is screaming at 10 seconds old and nobody, they're like, you're good. You have your baby. But like, what if that doesn't happen? Like, when does that look like then? Like, have you asked those questions to your provider? Like what happens if the, you know, the crap hits the fan and um, I'm trying to be nice for Facebook. So, <laughs> uh, um, what happens if that happens? What, you know, if the unexpected happens, then what, then what does that look like to you? So I really like to encourage clients, people to ask the hard questions about the what ifs, because if we don't know what the what ifs look like, then we can't plan for them. And then once you plan for them, you can stick them in the back of your head and start thinking all about the good stuff, but you don't have to keep 
rolling them over at the beginning of the hospital. Um, and same thing. What happens if you end up, you're planning a vaginal birth. What happens if you end up in a cesarean? How does that change your immediate postpartum? How does that change your hospital stay? How does that change, um, you know, the very beginning? Um, what does that look like? And so you can have some expectations to what, to what that immediate postpartum looks like. Um, what if you're planning an out of hospital birth and need to transfer into the hospital? Like all of these things are scary. And a lot of times we don't talk about them because they're like, well, that's not going to happen to me. I'm just going to have, I'm going to push this baby out. I'm like, sometimes it happens. I've seen fourth babies try to come out with their forehead. doesn't work. Like I've seen, you know, people end up with breech births, which we'll, we'll not go there. I'm listening to a breach podcast right now. So, <laughs> but for most people, that means a cesarean. So like it, what does that look like when it's not your, like, it's not your fault or it's not something that we could have planned, but it just happens. Um, what happens if baby comes out and needs a NICU stay? How are you and your partner getting back and forth to the NICU? Who's watching your other kids? Who's taking care of your pets? What if the NICU, you know, what if you went to a hospital that's an hour away from your house? How are you, how are you commuting? How are you doing these kinds of drives, right? Ask the questions so that you can make a plan. And then that way you can write it down, journal about it, stick it in the filing cabinets in the back of your head, like talk about it with your partner, your mom, your doula. So somebody has the plan that then you don't have to think about it anymore. And then you can go back to thinking about making this the best birth that you can. So, you know, when we're talking about immediate postpartum, those first couple hours, especially that is something like I so encourage you guys to take some kind of childbirth class. Um, and preferably taking something outside of the hospital because the hospital likes to teach you how to be a good patient. Um, some, some hospital classes out there are really awesome and amazing, but the vast majority is like, how, this is what it looks like in our hospital. And this is, here's how you can be a, here's how it's gonna look for you. And it, it's kind of training you to be a good patient. So. Um, can you take another class? Can you do something that helps you ask the questions so that you get what you really want and you're not put on this conveyor belt that is birth, right? Um, are there any like immediate postpartum questions? Like, I'll just keep talking if y'all don't have I, <laughs> I actually have, I have a sweet comment from Facebook I'd love to share. Um, yeah. Kay says she's three weeks postpartum and it's been amazing so far. Thanks to all the prep work I've put in with Laura. Oh, I love Kay. Kayla's such a cutie. Um, I'm so glad you're listening, Kayla. Um, yeah, she did so much work and it's like, it's so like watching her and her, her daughter, her, she's an older daughter and they're just, oh my God, they're so beautiful and gorgeous. And they have, they had so much support set up that it makes such a huge difference. So, so huge. Um, so then what's your, like, what does your first week look like? Okay, so for a lot of people, that means you're in the hospital for a couple days. So have you prepped for the hospital? Like, have you brought all your chargers? Partners, have you brought all the warm things if you're in the hospital? Like, <laughs> um, and and the, the chapstick and lotion, like, mm -hmm. it's so, so dry. dry. So, so dry. dry. Um, did you, like do you have a plan? Like, what do you want to do for a bath? Like, I know that's like silly little things, but like, we don't, most of the time they don't bathe babies in the like delivery room, so to say anymore. Like usually that's done 24 ish hours after baby, like sometime the next day, or if you get, you know, birth at three in the morning, they'll come at like four in the afternoon, those kind of things. Like, but do you want to do it? Do you want your partner to do it? Do they take the baby from the room? Do they do it in the room? Do you want to skip it? Do you want to bring your own soap? Do you want to bring nothing? Do you want to just, you know, all these things, like <laughs> all the little things, like how many questions can you ask? If you're at home, like, um, or out of the hospital, like, what does that look like? Do you have support set up? When are your care providers going to come visit you? How are you knowing that baby's doing okay? Who are you calling if you have questions? Um, are those phone numbers in your phone and your partner's phone? Um, you know, all of those things make this huge difference. And when you ask, again, ask the questions before so that when stuff comes up, you're just like, oh, I just pushed a button. Talk to my wife or talk to whoever. Also, I just did this. I have to share this really random meme I saw. There's apparently kids now do this when they talk on the phone. <laughs> 
sorry. <laughs> um, I just thought it was really funny and it makes so much sense, but it has nothing to do with this, but I couldn't help but share. <laughs> um, so, um, and now I lost my train of thought. Um, but so what can you do to prep for that immediate postpartum? Who is, who is making your food? Who is, um, so this is where I start to encourage people. We get some of these big things we get like food, um, who's bringing you water, who's bringing like, who's getting you nutrition. Most of the time people start to think about that kind of stuff. But then I tell people like, make a list, start walking around your house now and do make a list of every single thing you do throughout the day. Who's getting your mail? Who's taking the dog on a walk? Who's taking the trash out? Who's making dinner? Who's, I don't know, calling the pest control guy? Who's like, how many of these things do you have set up? How many of these things do you do? How many things can these, can you pass them on to your partner or is your partner, what's your partner situation look like? Like, um, so does your partner go back to work three days postpartum? Do they get a week off? Do they get two weeks off? Are they like amazing? I just had, I just had a couple, they got, dad got 12 weeks off. They both got 12 weeks paid vacation. So if you, you can go work at GoDaddy if you really want some good paternity leave. Or, um, the other one um, yes. <laughs> say it again, Jenny. Or Intel. Intel's good. And uh, Bank, uh, Bank of America, I think, that one of the banks does have a really good Bank of America. Bank. Um, but like most people, like, um, like my husband had to use all of his vacation time. Like he could take FMLA, but it's unpaid. Like, so what, how are you guys what is your uh, maternity leave look like? Like, you know, most birthing people are going to have a little bit of time, but some don't like, how are you, how are you setting yourself up for this? Because when, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to bring some props in. So this is my, my handy dandy placenta friend. Oh, and my uterus fell on the floor. <laughs> so this is like, although this is, this is way thicker than a normal placenta, like this is pretty average like size for a placenta, like in Diane, like, you know, it's like maybe a touch big, but like you get a small dinner plate that comes off the inside of your uterine wall. And like, yes, your uterus starts to shrink back down, but not it. It doesn't just like smooth itself out. Like it has all kinds of nooks and crannies. And like, this is what you're healing from on the inside. So if you have, if you're going back and asking, asked to go back to work, at a week postpartum or two weeks postpartum, like I, you know, for some people I get it. Like you have to, like, do you know, if you're going to keep a roof over your head, you have to, but like, how can you make whatever time you have at home, the most beneficial for you? Because if you're up at, you know, two days postpartum running around your house, cleaning like a maniac, and then you go back at two weeks, I'm real, who your hormones, your pelvic floor, your like, your whole body is going to just like suffer and I don't want anyone to suffer like I want you guys to have this like amazing time together so um so how do we how do we prep and plan for that like um how do we get that so like if you have six weeks off great if your partner has two weeks off maybe like I feel like that's what ends up being average for a lot of people that I work with just not enough but it's what we got, right? It's what we're working with. Um, how do you guys figure out how you're going to make that work? What happens if your partner does go back to work at two, three, four days postpartum? Like Jenny was saying in the beginning, she was really lonely. Like, do you have a friend that can just come over and sit with you? Like, can they bring their six month old and hang out at your house all day long? Can you like rotate your friends and be like, okay, from Tuesday, from noon to two, can you come to my house? Or, you know, and then on Thursday, my, um, my other friend's going to come and like, can you plan it? Can you like putting stuff in place? Because, you know, I'm, I'm the worst about this. I'll be like, we should hang out. Oh, a year later, we should still hang out. <laughs> right. And I mean, I'm not like my youngest is four. Like, and this is not, this is not something like that goes away. So, um, so that's, I, you know, there's lots of things out there that you guys can do, but putting a plan in place. So, um, there's a really great resource, um, called the, the seven sisters. Um, and 
they, you know, it's like this, you can take classes or buy the book. Um, but it's like, you have seven different people. Really. It's like, ideally you have like 10 people in your life and, you know, for backups when somebody can't make it kind of thing. And somebody, um, agrees to bring you food one day a week for six weeks. So every Monday that person's going to bring you food or for whatever length of time, four weeks, six weeks, like however you guys plan it out, but that person or that family is going to bring you food. And if they can't, then somebody else is going to step in. So you need, you need a coordinator, like you need a friend, doula, somebody that's going to be your coordinator of this, but like, it's something that you help set up beforehand. Um, and they can come in and maybe they can help you with a chore. If you don't want to see people, they can leave the food at your front door. Like, and you just have to start, start setting these expectations. So we're going to talk about expectations in just a minute. Something to just say about that. Yeah. So, yes, please. so, you know, I was one of those people who probably would not have ever thought that I could set up a seven sisters. Like I would have been like, no, no one would do that for me. Like, right. Right. Like, like that seems ridiculous. That seems like that's so hard. And yet I, I, I have done it now for three different people. And I'm telling you, I, as a person doing the seven sisters got so much more out of it, I think, than the person who got the food back because yeah. I could go in and fix something for someone so easily. I got to connect with them. And like, I feel like I'm so much closer to them. Like I remember one of our speakers, Iana, I was, I think she was the first one that I did seven sisters for. And one day I came and brought her a meal and I was like, what can I help you with? And she's like, could you help me clean up my bedroom? And I was like, yeah. And I went in and I cleaned her bedroom. I vacuumed it and I felt so amazing. <laughs> Yeah. my house may be a total freaking wreck but I did something amazing for someone else Somebody else right right and and it made a difference for her and yeah so I I'm a big proponent of that I love the seven sisters thing yeah yeah so the other thing is never ever 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 say no to help okay like we I I get it I'm the worst oh I'm fine I'm good I'm great don't worry about me like <laughs> I, I sometimes I preach better than I practice and things, but I'm still going to preach it at you. So, um, but you can't like, you've got to start getting over it. If someone's coming over, can you, can I, do you need anything? Oh man, I need a gallon of milk or you know what, when you come over, the dogs haven't been out in like three days. Can you take them for a walk? Like, so we've been eating leftover mac and cheese for two days. Is there any way you can bring dinner? Like, <laughs> just ask because like Jenny just said, the people that are coming want to help, but a lot of times they don't know how to help. And it's like, well, I don't want to bring you another casserole if you have six in your freezer that you're not eating. Like, but how can I, how can I help you? Um, so that list that you made earlier, right. In your, in your prenatal period, when you're still pregnant and you walked around and you're like, Oh, I get the mail and I got, did my dishes. That list now can go on your fridge or counter or wherever. And when people come over that want to hold the baby and be like, can you pick a chore off the list on the fridge? And then you can hold the baby. Cause by then they'll probably be done nursing and ready and really excited to see you. And then while you hold the baby, I'm going to go take a nap. Like this is how postpartum should look. You should be in your bathrobe the whole time, like, or like fuzzy slippers and pajama pants, like whatever feel makes you feel comfortable. Like and you should forewarn people if you are intending to breastfeed, if they come over, they're probably going to see some boob. Like, <laughs> um, cause it's just, and if they're not comfortable with that, then they need to wait. Like it just doesn't, it's, this is the expectation. So we need to start setting expectations for our family, our friends. Um, you know, yeah, sorry, not sorry. Like, <laughs> but seriously, when you come over, if you come over to somebody's house and they're like, makeup done, hair done, and they've got jeans on, like they look like they're ready to entertain, right? Like they look like they want you to stay. If you come over and somebody's in like a tank top and pajama shorts, this is me, tank, like nursing top, nursing tank, pajama shorts, that probably has spit up on it somewhere. And I have a baby on the boob and just a diaper. Like they're like, okay, we're going to go now and let you rest. Like, right. It makes like, I love that, Laura. Ah, I think Sorry, I, I just oh, got to jump in because it's so true. Like you, in your postpartum, your job is not to entertain. Your job is to take care of that baby and to bond yeah. with that baby. And I think so often we, we don't distinguish between our role as a mom because it's still new to us. Mm -hmm. And yeah. our previous role, especially if it's your first child, our previous role of if anybody ever does come over, 
we're entertaining. Yeah. And, and so it's so, so important. And I do think it's, it's so true that the, the impression you give to people when they come inside your house, it, it makes all the difference. It does. And that list on your fridge, dude, I, I just have to say, and, I use that all the time. I, right? I tell people that all the time. Put a list but the, the list is so nice because then whoever's coming over can take, like, can make their own decisions. So it's like, I'm not asking you know, my squeamish friend that doesn't like poop to go clean my toilets, right? Like, you know, or I'm not asking, you know, but maybe they are totally good with doing my dishes, but I know people that won't do dishes because they are terrified to put something away wrong. Like their kitchen is, you know, very particular. And like, they're just so worried if I put something, you know, I don't know where half the stuff is in my kitchen. So please do my dishes. (laughs) Like, um, we'll find it eventually. It's not that big, (laughs) but like, it gives them the opportunity, your friends, your family to pick something that is easy for them. Maybe, you know, dad comes over and he takes the trash out every day at home and he's totally good taking your trash out. And then he'll even go put it on the curb for you. Like those kinds of things, dad's probably going to be way better at taking your trash out than cleaning your bedroom. Like it's just kind of that way, you, you know, you give people that opportunity, but I know people they've sent out emails, they put signs on the door, they um, like give these people, give your family and friends some realistic expectations. So like, I would love for you to come over from 12 to 1230. Like, I, I so want to see you, but I can only handle people for a half an hour. Like, or, you know, if someone's planning on coming over and you don't want to be out there, feed the baby, give them to your partner and then go back to bed. Like, your partner can entertain them. Like it's, that's not your job. Is this, these shouldn't be social visits for you or for the people coming over. It should be that our society needs to start putting mom first again and our families first, really like this birthing person just went through a lot, but instinctually, if we take care of our birthing people, they will take care of their babies. And so we're also worried, is the baby okay? Can I help the baby? Can I do anything with baby? Well, my baby's going to be fine, but I could use a granola bar and a Gatorade. Like, I mean, that, you know, those kinds of things are what we, what we want. Well, I'll let you finish nursing and then I'll hold your baby while I sit on the couch and do nothing. It's like, well, can you like, you're not going to get baby anyway. So these are the kinds of things that we need to plan for. So send out an email or get, make a phone call, start telling them. And the other thing is, when are you going to let people or invite people to come over? Right. Um, a week, <laughs> like <laughs> not the day you get home from the hospital. Like there are some people that want and need that. Like they need, like for me, I was like, my in-laws, please come over. I love my in-laws and they are so helpful. And I'm like, can you please come over and take my other child? Like that was what I needed. I'm like, please take my other child. Please take, please take him and take him to the park. And that they were great. And then when they would come back, I would be like, here's the baby. I'll be back in 20 minutes. And like, they would hang out and like, it was amazing. They were so helpful. But if, you know, if that's not something that your in-laws are going to do, then they don't need to come over. Like, or they can come over for 20 minutes and then you can ask them and just be like, well, I'm going to nurse now and you can start pulling a boob out. And that a lot of times get father-in-laws to go away pretty fast. So, you know, like, but when we don't talk about these expectations up front and, you know, in some, in some ways COVID's helped because like, we can't have them sitting in the waiting room anymore at the hospital, like, <laughs> no one will allow it. But if, you, if that's going to stretch you out to have them come over, even when you get home from the hospital, like it's okay to um, not invite them. It's also okay not to tell them. So um, I'm giving you full permission right now to not tell anybody that you've had a baby for a week. Like if you really want to post it on Facebook, that's your prerogative. But now that's open to the outside world, but it's okay to not tell people like if they're going to make your life harder, it's really, really okay to be like, Hey, I had a baby two days ago, but I'm feeling really good now. And I would like for you to come over. Those kinds of things can be helpful. It's really okay to not tell people you're in labor too. We can just step back. It's really okay to tell people you're not going to the hospital or that you called the midwife over or that whatever your birthing situation looks like, it's okay to not share with anybody, but the important people and the people that you need there. Um, okay. So can I interject? Yes, please. I, I think too. So often we do have expectations 
but we are not making them known out loud. Yes. yes. Right. Like they're in our head, but that they stay there and then nobody knows. So then we feel like our expectations have been like not fulfilled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But it's because we didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. um, so taking responsibility to make sure that if you do have expectations, you're making sure to tell people what those are at the very least your partner so that they can, you know, kind of run point for you. Yeah. Right. When you may not be all there um, and in that fog postpartum, especially in those early days, maybe weeks and you know, your head is not all there. Right. Yeah. You're doing the best you can, but for somebody else to know and be able to kind of be your bouncer. Yeah. is so, so helpful. Um, so I'd like to pose the, the question, if anyone wants to chime in, was there something that happened in your first couple of weeks postpartum that was really, really helpful for you? We'll flip Sarah's question a little bit. <laughs> for me, um, with all three of my babies, my mom came over pretty much every day for the first two weeks and did something. I, I, I probably don't even know all the things she did because I was in my room <laughs> feeding a baby. But I'm pretty sure she did the laundry. She made us a meal and she usually brought groceries too. And my husband was always very happy when she was done, right? Like he'd be like, oh, look what your mom brought. Oh, she's so great. Could she just be here all the time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so for me, that was definitely what made a huge difference, yeah. That's amazing. So did you do anything was this a, your mom just did this because this is the type of person your mom is, or was this a conversation that you had beforehand that you told her what would be helpful? I think she just did it, did it. which is probably good. Cause I don't think that I would have told her what needed to be done. I would have been like, oh, well, you could just sit with me. It's fine. Right. Even though like there were piles and piles of and milk covered yeah. laundry like she yeah. washed my bras I remember that and I was like oh the bra is so nice and clean <laughs> <laughs> it's not crusty anymore <laughs> I probably never would have asked even though that was so disgusting and my bras were all stinky um yeah I, so it's interesting because she was definitely the one who came and did it and which is wonderful but I didn't ask anyone else like I, I and I didn't ask her right I just yeah. It just happened. And yeah, I think that that also might have compounded the, you know, the loneliness because once she, you know, she did it for two weeks, which is a long time, yeah. then she needed to get back to her job. And, you know, I was like, oh, okay. That's yeah, just me. Yeah. yeah. It's just you. yeah. Um, Darcy says food to eat with one hand and new underwear. <laughs> Both of those are really good. <laughs> um, Anyone else have anything that was really helpful for them in the first couple of weeks? Yeah. Hey, Danielle. All right. I'm on mute. Um, I had my fly, my aunt fly out and she grocery shopping and she cooked meals for like a week to help out. That's awesome. Um, when my first was born. So we're coordinating for people to fly out this time for like two awesome. or three weeks, hopefully. But That's great. Yeah. Well, good, good for you for getting people to come to Arizona in July. <laughs> Trying. We're figuring that out now with our second, which is in two months. But I <laughs> aunt left. I actually, we need to help more the second week. And I actually sent a mass email or a text to all my friends because I didn't plan that. And they all, someone had to do a chore when they came to visit, if they wanted to see the baby or they had to bring some kind of food. And so for <laughs> each day, a whole week, we had people come and That's like, amazing. yeah, it made a world of a difference doing that. So when you sent out your, your cry for help or mass text, was it like, uh, did you set your expectations to, so your friends knew what you needed? I was like, I normally don't ever ask for help. And I realized, oh shit, I need help because right. we're drowning here. And so I was being honest and I was like, is anybody willing to give me bone broth with herbs? Cause I was in medical school at the time. And then like help with laundry or just bring some snacks or hold baby, you know, or keep me company. Cause I was lonely yeah. too. Yeah. So I kind of listed my needs and then each person was like, I can do this or this. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's amazing. Thanks, Danielle. Like Thank you. that's like putting out your needs. And even if it, you know, it comes up like, I don't ever ask for this, but I need this right now. People are usually really, really helpful in that, in that front. So I'm, I'm so glad you asked. That's amazing. Um, Oh, Darcy, that's a big one. She said, Darcy says safe co-sleeping guidelines. That's huge. Um, dishes, washing pump parts. Yeah, man, if you guys have to pump, like, 
that's a big journey for a lot of people. And pump parts are a pain in the butt. Like they are little and they're tiny and there's like a gajillion four of them. And it's like, if you're pumping, you're likely pumping. If you're pumping that early, you're likely pumping a lot. And so like somebody to come wash your pump bar. It's like, like those kinds of things. Um, so all of these are really, really awesome tools and techniques and things. Um, and so I hope some of this is helping to, to, um, uh, to, to, give you ideas of how to help start structuring your, um, your postpartum. Um, so then as we kind of move out of our like initial postpartum, um, like after those first two weeks, usually we start to feel like if we've, so, um, okay. So I haven't given you like my big rule of thumb that I give everybody that I'm, if you have a doula, you've probably heard this, but we're going to keep saying it, but and this is like bare minimum, right? So five days in bed, five days around the bedroom, five days around the house. So that's first 15 days. And there's like, you know, like three reasons that you get to leave the house. And it's like, if you need a lactation consultant, if you need a chiropractor, or if you need like some kind of medical attention, those are like the reasons you should leave your house. And a lot, I know all three of these can get people to come to your house if you do the work up front. So um, and now everything in there, everything's virtual. So a lot of that can be taken care of virtually. A lot of that is like, if you need those people to, and you're seeing them prenatally, that gives, that helps too. Um, so <clears throat> we'll talk, let's talk about resources in just a minute here, but, um, but otherwise you should be in your bed, like in your bed, not out on the couch, not like, you know, there's some guidelines, but like, ideally you're in your bed for five days. And the only reason you're getting up is to go to the bathroom. Like somebody else is bringing you food. Someone else is bringing you water. Like this gives your tissues time to heal. This gives your uterus time to heal this. And ideally your legs are together. So all of everything's coming back together. Um, but it makes a huge difference. Um, you and baby, if you're in bed, you're going to sleep more. Baby's going to sleep more. So, um, Darcy mentioned in here, um, about safe co-sleeping guidelines. I highly, highly encourage you to look up safe co-sleeping guidelines, even if you have no intention of co-sleeping. And I guess I should, I should make this more detailed. Safe bed sharing guidelines, because co-sleeping can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but you should know how to sleep safely with your baby in your bed, because most parents fall asleep with their baby at some point because our milk is meant to make our baby tired and it's the same hormones that make us tired. Um, so at 3 a.m. when you are trying to um, nurse your baby back to sleep, it's real likely you're going to fall back to sleep with them. And it's so, so much safer to do it on a safe, flat surface um, that you have prepared for instead of doing it in a recliner. So she's been there, done that. Um, and it happens. It happens. And then you know better and then you can do better. So those kinds of things. Let's look them up beforehand so that um, you don't have to start <laughs> trying to figure out sleep situations um, when you have a baby that doesn't want to sleep and you're sleep deprived. Um, but you're going to sleep more. Baby's going to sleep more. You're going to nurse more because you know you're in your own bedroom. You can shut out the rest of the world, right? Who cares if the dishes are mile high in your sink? Who cares if the dog peed on the floor? Who cares if, you know, there's um, whatever else is going on. Your, your toddler pulled out every toy in the house and now it's in the living room. You don't know, so you don't care, right? So you're in your room. Now, if that's like a whole lot to do, you have to go out to the couch. You have to get out of your bedroom do it. But if you start seeing things that need done around the house and you can't help, but do them, then go back to bed. Okay. If you have more than one baby, stay in bed. Like <laughs> Your toddler is not going to understand that mom needs to rest all day long, every day. Like you're going to watch them bounce off the wall and it's okay if they get lots of TV time in the first few weeks. It's okay. If they're not, if they wear their pajamas for three days, it's okay. Like it's totally fine. They made a mud puddle in the backyard and now they need a bath. Like it's cool. Just lower the expectations on the toddler fronts or the kid front really like, but what are your plans for that child? Like 
if you are taking care of you and you're in bed, who is taking your child to school? Who's um, coming over to babysit, nanny? Like whose house are they going to? Like, what are you, what's your plans for your older kids? Cause you know, for me, it was like a 20 month old can only stay in the house for so long. And then that leads to going to the park when you're way too postpartum to, um, to really be doing that. So, um, so again, start making plans, um, five days around the bed. So that means you're like around the bedroom. So maybe you're getting up and you're taking a shower a little bit more often and you're, um, like doing little things around your bedroom. So like maybe you're taking your pump parts, you're the one starting to take pump parts back to the kitchen or you get up to get a little snack and then you come back to bed. Like second week, great. You're mostly in bed doing little things. Third week, um, like up and around the house. But again, that means like maybe you're helping make lunch and then you go sit back down on the couch. Like this doesn't mean that you're cooking a five course meal for the for your entire family. Like just because you can do it in the house doesn't mean (laughs) that's around the house. Like take it easy. Um, our, your bleeding can be a really great indicator on how much you're doing. So if you, after you have a baby, you bleed, um, cause our, that wound inside your uterus is healing and shrinking and, um, it's, we're going, you're going to bleed. So when you first start bleeding, it's very heavy. It's like, you're a really, really heavy period and lots of bright red. And sorry, I should have put a disclaimer on this before we started talking about it, but um, <laughs> that should get less and less every day. So we should get, you know, down to like a light period. Maybe you've got some brown spotty. And then that's when we start feeling really good. And then we go take a two mile walk or we go to the grocery store for the first time and we're out for two hours. And then you come home and you're like, Oh, okay. We need a, (laughs) that's something different. That's your body telling you to slow down, slow back down, ease back into your life. So this kind of what, when we get to that two to like six weeks postpartum, this is when it's hard when it's like the rest of the world has dropped off. Your mom's gone back. Your friends are back in school or your friend back at work. You're, you know, um, like we've lost a lot of our help. So what is your plan for this two to six week mark? Like, how do you, what's, what's happening with your older kids? Like, are you ready to be mom again? I don't know. Can you send for a laundry service so that we can help with like, what are we giving up? Cause you can't go back to being, you're not going to be super mom at two weeks. And I don't want you to be super mom at two weeks because remember first 40 days, 40 days, we're at 14 days. First 40 days of your postpartum is dictating next 40 years of your maternal health. Like that's big. That's huge. That's really, really big. And so, um, yeah, Darcy said mastitis can be right around the corner too, right? This, we start doing things. We start here's a pacifier. I'll feed you in five minutes. Like, and then it's like, God, why is my boob hurt? Why do I feel like crap? And now we're like, how are we getting those next few weeks covered? But that way, by the time we're hitting six weeks, usually our uterus is pretty healed and we can start easing ourselves back into regular life. You're probably not going to have a pristine home. I have five and four to five year old. I still don't like, God help us if our house is clean for 10 minutes. Like, (laughs) um, usually right before someone comes over. Um, like those are like, that's just life now. Like, um, it's how do we start, but what is, how do we make that two to six week mark a lot better? Um, so this is where you may need some outside resources to come in. Like, Postpartum doulas are little bits of people that are sent from heaven to like make all of our lives better. And everybody should have a postpartum doula. (laughs) Like everyone should have a postpartum doula and God help all those women that, um, and people that are postpartum doulas because I, it's not my forte. Like, um, but you know, so postpartum doulas can come into your world and they take care of mom. Like they take care of the family and then the baby is their second, their secondary to look after because they really, really believe that 
um, they really, really believe that if the, that they're a dyad, mom, baby are a dyad. And if you take care of mom, you're taking care of baby already. So sometimes for mom, that is taking care of baby. Maybe they're up at night and making sure that baby's um, diapered and um, calm before they come in for a feeding. And then after the feeding, they can get baby back to bed so that you're only up for 20 minutes instead of an hour at the middle of the night. Like maybe they're there at, maybe they come over first thing in the morning. So they get there at seven and they are there until lunchtime and they have, you know, started a load of laundry, taken baby while you go back to bed. Um, you know, depending on what your arrangements are, they can help get kids off to school. Like all these things, postpartum doulas can come in and step in and help. And a lot of times that comes when our family has stepped away. Um, and it's not that our family doesn't want to help, but again, it's hard to to put your own life on hold. That's not our culture. Like it's not our, so unless you have a parent that's retired, which for, you know, I didn't like both my in-laws, my parents were still working when I was having babies. Um, and so, and even my, my retired parents, my, my parents are retired now and they're so dang busy that they still wouldn't like, <laughs> it would still be hard for them to come over like every day for weeks and weeks on end. Um, so maybe you don't have a postpartum doula coming over, um, every day. Sometimes they can come over every day. Um, but maybe they're coming once a week and you could be like, okay, I just have to get till Friday. The doula is coming on Friday and I can make it till Friday. I've, I'm going to sleep the whole time she's here. And like, right. It just, it makes our brain like be able to wrap our heads around it a little bit. Um, instead of like, I'm on my own and I have no idea when I have help coming, like, and usually again, by that two week mark, now our partners, a lot of times are back at work. So you're home alone all day long and they come home and they're tired from work because they just worked eight, 10 hours. Who's making dinner? Like, <laughs> are we sustaining ourselves on takeout and pizza? Or like, do we have, maybe you've been asking people in your first weeks, like, could you bring us a meal for tonight? and like double it and we can freeze part of it. So then you can use it in two weeks. Like, I don't know, like I, this is, it's hard. Like, I don't know what your situation looks like, what your, um, what your life looks like, but at two week mark, people start falling off. And um, that's a lot of times when we need people the most and we really need um, our support system. So maybe that's like, you're putting a text out and you're like, I'm drowning. I don't ask for this, but please help. Like um, can someone take my kid today? Like, is anyone going to the park? <laughs> can my older child tag along? Um, right. And you just like, most people are, um, you know, most people are more than happy to help. So, um, we've got a comment. My goal is that getting a doula is as normal as getting a wedding planner for your wedding, like, or a realtor to buy a house. Like, isn't that the truth? Like, like you don't go climb Everest without a Sherpa, right? Like if somebody leads you through this, what did I hear? I heard one the other day. It was so amazing. Um, if you, a doula is like, if you go to the car dealer or if you go to the mechanic with your uncle Joe, who's like really car savvy, like, so you don't feel like you're getting screwed over by the mechanics, right? Like in all places in life, we can totally have somebody. So for, we have doulas for birth, pregnancy and birth. We have doulas for postpartum lots for a lot of those they interconnect some of them are like i'm only here or i'm only here but we usually know each other so like <laughs> um if i'm not your postpartum doula because i'm not um i have other people that are and they're amazing and wonderful and like they're just they're so important and um it's you know how do we kind of get through those next that next month so Anyone have any ideas that they would like to add or something that really um, stuck out that was helpful for them in those, um, that after the newness has worn off a little bit? No, we have a couple of comments in the chat. Diley had said, it's been seven years between my kids. I don't remember being in bed that long. I'm thinking after my baby, I can organize my life since I will be at home. Yeah, totally. Perfect perfect thoughts. I know. And it, I, my first two were five years apart. And I remember thinking I was going to like write a book during my postpartum. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that totally did not happen. Yeah. <laughs> Our brains are really good at like, putting a lot of the stuff behind us because our as a species we need to continue to reproduce and so it's like sometimes we block out the things that were hard um and they don't pop back up until um we're in it again so Mm -hmm. if you know especially if you if this is your first baby um like amazing but even especially if it's your second third fourth baby like please plan, like, please take some time. Like this is, you are probably feeling okay about your birth. If maybe you're not like, you know, if you need some help with birth, think if we're talking that kind of stuff, like let's start there. But like, maybe you're feeling comfortable about your birth. And so we're just like, I'm good. I got this. It's like, no, man, now you need to like take all the time that you were, you plan for your birth and plan for your postpartum because you've never been a mom to a baby, to a family of two. Like you've never, your family has never been a family of you're adding another human into your life. Um, and it's not going to be the same. It's really not. Um, and so it's just, it's so, it's going to make, it would make such a difference. Like, um, it makes such a difference. So this may be what, where you're going next, but I think a really important part of planning, like you're talking about postpartum doulas, but I think, um, you know, before when you were saying like, plan for the things that might happen, the what ifs. Mm -hmm. And I think getting to know or finding some providers within the different areas that may come up after a birth. So you mentioned, you know, like a lactation consultant or a chiropractor, things like that. Like, like, you know how, I, I don't know who, if people do this anymore, but like, I know when, when I was having my kids, you could go and like interview your pediatrician. Yeah. or a prospective pediatrician. So yeah. I think there's something to be said to knowing a provider, getting in with them before you have your baby to meet them face-to-face. You feel like you have a connection already before then you may need them. And hey, best case scenario, you don't need them. You don't need them, right? right? And that's fine, all well and good and yay, right? Like one less yeah. thing, but if you do need them, you already have a relationship with that person. Mm-hmm. So that would be a big thing that I did not do well. Um, And so I think I went without some of those supports that I probably should have had, but I went without them because I didn't feel like I knew who to reach out to Mm -hmm. afterwards. So So that's a great segue, Sarah, because at two weeks, a lot of times that's where we start. We're like, if something's going wrong, like I'm at my wit's end. I'm like, I can't, I can't handle this anymore. I'm like peace out. I'm done breastfeeding, which if you're having breastfeeding problems, like I really hope you're not waiting two weeks to get help. But like, but you're like, I've been sitting like this for two weeks and I can't move my neck. Like my, like, you know, it's all these things are starting to move. And like, um, so those are good things to start, to start gathering now. So, um, what I would love for you guys, what, provider wise, who was the most helpful? Um, like my list that I have for clients, I'm like, you need a lactation consultant. I mean, I, they do, they all do prenatal visits. Um, like prenatal visits are amazing and awesome. And then like, you already know somebody like, um, like Jenny, I don't think you know this, but like you came and talked at a mom's group that I was like, um, like I did like group prenatal care. And so I was like, okay, at least I have a friendly face, like, <laughs> which I didn't even end up seeing Jenny, but I saw one of the other uh, ladies in the office, but like, I just like, like, so you have like something, you have some connection with people, which God help us. Cause we're all on zoom now. But, um, if you can go to things, if stuff starts opening back up, like, like um, well, let league meetings are great. Like, um, like just seeing people, beforehand go see a chiropractor like really hope you're seeing a chiropractor at the end of pregnancy because your baby's gonna come out a little easier but um uh a massage therapist can be great like especially ones that are like um versed in postpartum care because some of the big change they're like we won't touch you till six weeks but there are way awesome massages that you can do um start looking for a postpartum doula, or if you're not worried, if you want more baby care, they have newborn care specialist or a nanny, or, you know, some of those, like, it's kind of hard in the really early stages, but like those kinds of things, like, how are you gonna, can you guys both survive on being sleep deprived? Like, 
maybe your husband's a police officer and needs to be on his A-game and you're you're alone all night long, like you have no help, or they're not home. Like maybe your um maybe your partner was able to be here for the birth and now they are, you know, have to go across the country for some, whatever reason. Like those kinds of things um, can help. But I would love to hear provider wise, like who did you reach out to and go see? Well, Danielle would be like, you need an acupuncturist, right? Like <laughs> you guys can help crazy crazy. <laughs> like, really? No <laughs> kidding. <laughs> Oh, no, but that's the thing. Like we think about, I always think about acupuncture pre-birth, but like you guys, I'm sure are amazing for postpartum period um, too. I'll share what I did personally in the first and what I'm planning. Cause like I said, I'm doing like two months. So it, it it's what works for you. Like as a provider is what system of medicine works for you. If you're doing conventional OB gyne, that kind of thing, or if you're going midwife in chiropractic and acupuncture can fit in the limbo between that too. So it's like, I would say I did a midwife kind of like ob guide model the first time. And I would encourage if you feel the need to like, I can't lose my shit at two or three weeks, mm-hmm. push for an appointment at two or three weeks, yes. not the six weeks. Because we need them to, we are consumers. So we need to demand them to change that model anyways. Um, so if say I want two weeks and four weeks and six weeks, I don't care about insurance or push it. I would encourage that if you need something medically. Yeah. Um, always encourage chiropractic. I always encourage some kind of body work. Um, uh, acupuncture can help before and then definitely afterwards. If that's fits your model, I, as a provider, like to screen patients I've seen from fertility throughout pregnancy, or they come back for labor prep, but then usually about two to four weeks, they come back for building up and nourishment if they're needing it. Mm-hmm. But usually you give them the game plan of nutrition herbs and what is their team looking like? afterwards that's what I do on my end as a provider but um definitely do the work before baby comes like you said prenatal with lactation consultants and you know getting those tongue ties fit as early as possible saves your sanity mentally and prevents postpartum depletion because I my son was tongue tied we didn't get help for two months because all the providers I reached out to didn't know didn't listen and I knew he was tongue tied the day he was born I just knew something was off. So like trust your intuition and then get those resources. But if it's your second or third time around, like plan as much as you can. Um, Sometimes massage therapists come to you. Sometimes chiropractors or some in the Valley that do house calls. If you need something sooner for you and baby, or you can go visit them. Trying to think anything else. Midwives, you know, do more frequent house calls after and is included in their plan. Um, my midwife is actually does a postpartum package too. So she's going to be doing additional things as well. Um, those are some of the things that we're planning kind of honing everything in. It's a lot of work, but I'd rather do this than plan a freaking wedding. So (laughs) you know what I mean? Like you put so much effort into that, put effort into yourself and it sets way of how you parent, you know, and you know, cause you're postpartum for a year really. Yeah. And so building that foundation works. So those are my tidbits. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you guys for listening. Um, yeah, I get so wrapped up. I mean, 99% of my clients use midwifery care, but in a lot of the OB models, um, you don't get a postpartum visit with your your obstetrician until you're six weeks postpartum. Like, so you have a baby and then you don't see a medical provider for six weeks. And if that's not, that's not okay, if you're not okay. So it's really not okay. Even if you're feeling okay, you should still be like, someone should be checking in on you. But, um, if you, you know, feel dizzy, feel not feeling yourself, like press the press for that, go see somebody. So, um, the other big one, oh, go ahead, Jenny. I was going to say, I'm going to pop us off, uh, oh, sure. Facebook, just no, just so we get time. If anybody wants to ask any additional questions. Yeah. Um, so if you are on Facebook watching and you want to keep hearing about what's going on, go ahead and join us. I'm popping us off right now, just in case there's some questions people want to ask, not on Facebook. So here we go. 